Hello and welcome to another edition of Bread Theory. So tonight we're continuing on with The Conquest of Bread by Peter Kropotkin, and we're going to be doing chapter 12, which is called, uh, let's see, I had it just on my tip of my tongue, Objections. So we're going to be, he's going to be talking about all the people that uh, may have objections to the various theories that he's putting out there, and he's going to try to address the criticism uh, before he even puts out his theory. So uh, tonight, joining me is going to be Sean Scholes of the Tribunus Plebis podcast, and I'll be calling them in just a moment to get going. Um, it's a podcast that I like a lot. It talks about different leftist political stuff, usually uh, current events and, and things like that. So let's give Sean a call. And here we go. Hello. Hey, how we doing? Not too bad. How are you doing tonight, Sean? I'm doing awesome. All right. Uh, well, if you wouldn't mind starting by giving the chat your pronouns and as much of your biography as you feel comfortable sharing. Uh, so my name is Sean, obviously. Um, I go with he, him. Um, I'm the host of the Tribunus Plebis podcast. Um, I have three greyhounds, a cat, and a beautiful wife who is absolutely amazing. That's awesome. Very cool. Uh, what sort of topics do you usually cover on Tribunus Plebis? Uh, politics, mm -hmm. culture, um, you know, society, stuff like that. Cool. Very cool. How long have you been doing podcasting yourself? Podcasting has actually been exactly one year, about 10 days ago. I oh, believe. well, well, happy anniversary. Oh, uh, hey, thank you, man. <laughs> You're welcome. I very much enjoy listening to your show when I, when I manage to catch it. I always learn something. Oh, thank you. I appreciate that. Oh. I, I, I'm enjoying your uh, feed, too. Awesome. Great. All right. So tonight we are going to be diving into The Conquest of Bread, Chapter 12. Uh, so let's get right into that audio as soon as I can pull it up. And also feel free, Sean, anytime you feel like it, just tell me to pause it. You know, you don't, don't have to be too formal about it. And we can chat about any point that, that you find that you want to chat about. Excellent. Not a problem. All right. Well, here we go. This audio production was made in collaboration with Audible Anarchist. Chapter 12. Objections. Part 1. Let us now examine the principal objections put forth against communism. Most of them are evidently caused by a simple misunderstanding, yet they raise important questions and merit our attention. It is not for us to answer the objections raised by authoritarian communism. We ourselves hold with them. Civilized nations have suffered too much in the long, hard struggle for the emancipation of the individual to disown their past work and to tolerate a government that would make itself felt in the smallest details of a citizen's life, even if that government had no other aim than the good of the community. Should an authoritarian socialist society ever succeed in establishing itself, it could not last. General discontent would soon force it to break up or to reorganize itself on principles of liberty. It is of an anarchist communist society we are about to speak, a society that recognizes the absolute liberty of the individual, that does not admit of any authority, and makes use of no compulsion to drive men to work. Limiting our studies to the economic side of the question, let us see if such a society, composed of men as they are today, neither better nor worse, neither more nor less industrious, would have a chance of successful development. The objection is known, quote, if the existence of each is guaranteed, and if the necessity of earning wages does not compel men to work, nobody will work. Every man will lay the burden of his work on another if he's not forced to do it himself." Unquote. And boy, do we see that sort of argument in effect lately, with uh, people staying home and collecting unemployment rather than, than going for these super low-wage fast food jobs. I mean, the, the, these arguments really haven't changed in the past almost 150 years. It's pretty incredible that they just keep relying on that same sort of trope again and again. And yet they never see the flip side of it, where we're like, you know, if people aren't, would rather stay at home and, and, and collect unemployment than do your horrible job, then maybe you need to pay them better. 
because there's not really a problem getting people to work for higher wages, livable wages. It's, it's only the bottom part that seems to be struggling right now. What are your thoughts on that, Sean? Yeah, I agree. Um, and there's also the aspect of the COVID. Indeed. Right? So it, it could be unsafe for these people to go to work or, you know, they have uh, hesitancy to go back to work, which seems entirely natural to me. Yeah. Yeah. Risk your, your life for a job that probably doesn't pay benefits. And if they do, are not going to be great benefits. You may or may not even have sick days available to you um, for less than, than poverty wages. Yeah. That sounds like a heck of a deal to me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. All right. Well, let's continue on a little more. Okay. Let us first remark the incredible levity which this objection is raised without taking into consideration that the question is in reality merely to know, on the one hand, whether you effectively obtain by wage work the results you aim at, and, on the other hand, whether voluntary work is not already more productive today than work stimulated by wages, a question which would require profound study. But whereas in exact sciences, men give their opinion on subjects infinitely less important and less complicated after serious research. After carefully collecting and analyzing facts, on this question they will pronounce judgment without appeal, resting satisfied with any one particular event, such as, for example, the want of success of a communist association in America. They act like the barrister who does not see in the counsel for the opposite side a representative of a cause, or an opinion contrary to his own, but a simple adversary in an oratorical debate and if he be lucky enough to find a repartee, does not otherwise care to justify his cause. Therefore, the study of this essential basis of all political economy, the study of the most favorable conditions for giving society the greatest amount of useful products with the least waste of human energy, does not advance. They limit themselves to repeating commonplace assertions, or else they pretend ignorance of our assertions. Can we pause there? Go ahead. Um, Okay, so that was kind of a little bit of a long passage, but at the beginning, sure. there was one heck of a sentence. that I, ha I read that thing like 12 times to <laughs> figure out what it said, and it's really, uh, I don't know, it was just a great, a great, long, huge sentence that confused me for a while. But uh, sure. well, I, I think I know what he was getting at especially the question of whether like a wage, a wage laborer earns himself what the owners claim he does. Mm -hmm. And I, it seemed to me like he was referring to, you know, the full value of their work. Right. And the question of whether that forced or n almost forced, depending on how you look at it is whether that's really more efficient than work that's more voluntary uh -huh. or maybe even shared or you know you rotate out or even if it's done for pure joy right. like voluntary hobbyist stuff right and you know i'm of the belief that wage labor does not provide us with what the owners say it does oh and absolutely that voluntary not. work which we are kind of free to do or not to do can be and probably is just like more efficient which he's gonna get into yeah yeah i'd say in in pretty much any field i mean the, the the detractors always come back and say, well, who's going to pick up the garbage? Who's going to, you know, work in the sewers and stuff like that? But I think some people would still. I mean, there's pro I would collect garbage if it meant that my neighborhood was a cleaner place. I would uh, I would work in a cafe if it meant that I could serve people healthy food. I would, I would do a lot of jobs that people don't tend to like if I had everything provided for me, uh, all the basics that, at the very least provided for me, food, shelter, you know, education, uh, time off to pursue what I like, all, all that sort of thing. What, what sort of things would you do if, if uh, the prospect of starving was not an issue? Uh, I would do this. <laughs> you know what? I would too. <laughs> uh, you know what? I, I really don't know what I would do. Mm -hmm. I've never had, I've been working a lot of hours, a lot of really hard, to, hard working jobs since I was 16. Same, um, it's same, really same hard me, yeah. to, yeah, it's really hard to think about, like, if all of a sudden work ended and everything was provided, or not even everything was provided for, but there was just some basic level. Yeah, yeah, basic level. You know what I mean? Sure. And I, I, I don't know what I would do. I really don't. Yeah. I, I don't have some, 
I, I've never really had this a huge passion that really drove me. Like I never sure. wanted to be a fireman or uh -huh. a medic or anything like that. So I, yeah, I don't know what I would do. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I think the, the same is probably true of a lot of people. They just never really had the time to, to really ponder that or it's just never entered in as, as something that could ever happen. So it's not even worth, you know, wasting the mental effort on. But I, I, I would tend to think that at least all the essential things would, would still end up getting done because people would see the need. And, and, if, and if people felt like they were getting something back from doing it, you know, even if it was indirectly through getting their, their basic needs met. Yeah, that, that, that's good motivation to, to do a lot of stuff. That, that's a good way to kind of root people in place and, and make them truly care about the people that they're around and, and, you know, form those community bonds that are so often lacking when people are just moved around because they're, you know, for better or worse, human machines in a lot of cases, you know, just interchangeable parts to be moved where the, the labor is needed most, uh, according to the people that, that decide such things. So, yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I think that if you were seeing, you know, Zach down the street was every Monday he was going down and cleaning the gutters and the sewers and picking up right. the garbage that more people would say, Hey, you know, I'm going to go help him out or I'm going to do it on Wednesday or Thursday or, you know, and so on. Yeah, for sure. I, I'm I'm reminded of that movie, uh, Pay It Forward. Did you ever see that back in the day? It was it was a real big one. I believe I did. Yeah. Yeah, it was it was kind of a basic idea of mutual aid. Like they never spelled it out that way, of course, because they're never going to come any anywhere near any sort of actual leftist idea in a Hollywood movie. But but still, it it touched me even at the time. Like you know, the idea that do a few favors for other people and don't expect anything in return. That, that's the basis of mutual aid. And just through your example and, and the goodwill that you generate, they will then go on and do the same thing. And, and we start flipping things on its head where it's like, instead of, you know, what have you done for me lately? Or, or how can I get mine and, and slam the door behind me? It's how can I help even more? I like this feeling. I like this feeling of, of being a part of something bigger than myself, of helping people that need it. Um, so yeah, and I think I think systems of mutual aid are are exactly what they were talking about in that movie, and and could be. You know, it, it, you don't actually know until you try, and I, I think it'd be at least worthwhile to to do that on a massive scale, or at least a larger scale than it is. Yeah, for, yeah, absolutely. And if you don't mind, uh, the second half of the part that we just listened yeah, to. Yeah, yeah, let's keep going. Um, where he talks about they act like the barrister who does not see in the council for the opposite side a representative of a cause or an opinion mm -hmm. contrary to his own. But he's basically basically saying that they just uh, slide in with a with like a witty witty retort. Right. He does not otherwise care to justify his cause. And I actually really really love that paragraph. Yeah. And it's it's almost like That's he's big. predicting social media. Yeah, I was about to say the same thing, or it's especially the debate bro wing of social media. Yep, and the exact thing that I thought of when he he said that was Ben Shapiro. Exactly, exactly. And that whole you know cadre of the Twitter and YouTube crowd, he's like literally describing the bad faith actions of a guy like Shapiro. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, the guy who who builds his entire brand around just caring about the facts and the logics of the thing, but then ends up arguing emotionally almost exclusively for whatever it is he's believing in and, and changes. You can never quite pin down what he actually believes because he'll shift and, and, and morph uh, based on how he can attack his opponent. Uh, yeah. I think, I think that is very prescient of, of today's uh, social media for sure. Yeah. He nailed him 130 years, or uh, I guess 120 years before he was born. <laughs> well, I, <laughs> that reminds me. I remember uh, watching this this video um, from Big Joel, who's a, a, a famous leftist YouTuber, and he did a, he did one on Shapiro, who was watching the uh, Imagine video from from John Lennon, and he was pointing out how the way Shapiro framed the entire thing to have the video just playing over his words louder and louder and louder. It was as though John uh, uh, Lennon was owning him from beyond the grave. <laughs> and, and I think this, is, this happened again. I think this is kind of the trajectory of 
spends careers to preemptively be owned by people who have already thought about things. <laughs> yeah, it's just, you know, quick a quick, sharp response and then run away. That's which right. Which is, you know, the favorite weapon of these people. Oh, yes. If they can do that, you know, that quick, witty shot, that's it. There's that's no right. depth of thought or intelligence to go any deeper. Absolutely. Yeah, that's... You know, and, and when we get... Sorry to... No, no, go ahead. Go ahead. When we get too many of those sorts of people mm -hmm. um, who view anything different as... I don't know, evil or even just like doomed to fail either for, right. you know, like past examples or imagined horrors. We never right. move forward. I mean, they're conservatives. So I guess that's kind of definitionally what they do. <laughs> yes, they but do. It's, it's just crazy how Kropotkin nailed Shapiro like that. Yeah. A hundred years ago. That's really good. That's a re that's a really good analysis, too. I, I really appreciate that. Yeah. Yeah. The, the Gish Gallup is one of the favorite tools, especially of, of the alt-right debate guys. Um, not just Shapiro, but like, uh, oh, name is escaping me, but the small face guy, Charlie Kirk. That's the one he <laughs> loves. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And you know what I was thinking about too, when he, when I was listening to that was like in his time they had, I don't know if it was happening to him or with him, but there were mm -hmm. at that point, there were definitely thinkers who were, they'd mail letters to newspapers uh -huh. and, and you know they would fight in like the the letter section uh, of the newspaper the opinion section huh yeah wow and i always thought that was kind of wild it it happened in america and i know it j definitely happened in europe but yeah i just it just made me laugh thinking about that it was like the ancient twitter you know yeah, exactly oh could you imagine being canceled by mail wow <laughs> that would be so humiliating <laughs> uh Oh, that's funny. All right. Uh, did you have anything more about this passage? Uh, no, I think I'm good. All right. Well, let's move on then a little. What is most striking in this levity is that even in capitalist political economy, you'll already find a few writers compelled by the facts to doubt the axiom put forth by the founders of their science, that the threat of hunger is man's best stimulant for productive work. They begin to perceive that in production, a certain collective element is introduced, which has been too much neglected up till now and which might be more important than personal gain. The inferior quality of wage work, the terrible waste of human energy in modern agricultural and industrial labor, the ever-growing quantity of pleasure seekers who today load their burden on others' shoulders, the absence of a certain animation in production that is becoming more and more apparent. All this begins to preoccupy the economists of the classical school. Some of them ask themselves if they have not got on the wrong track. If the imaginary evil being that was supposed to be tempted exclusively by bait of lucre or wages really exists. This heresy penetrates even into their universities. It is found in books of orthodox economy. This does not hinder a great many socialist reformers to remain partisans of individual remuneration and defending the old citadel of wagedom, notwithstanding that it is being delivered over stone by stone to the assailants by its former defenders. They fear that without compulsion, the masses will not work. But during our own lifetime, have we not heard the same fears expressed twice? By the anti-abolitionists in America before Negro emancipation, and by the Russian nobility before the liberation of the serfs? Can, can we pause? Yeah, I was just about to do the same. Go ahead. Okay, because I, I, I just wanted to say something before we got to the slave and the abolitionist stuff. Sure thing. Um, where he was talking about the econ economists of the classical school and all that stuff and yeah. the imaginary evil being. Yeah. I mean, this is everything that he wrote there is why the idea of a free market of labor or even a free contract or mm -hmm. like a, I guess it's like a simple, real freedom of choice. Exactly. Existing. It, it, it's just so insane. Right. Like without money, we go hungry or homeless or even mm -hmm. worse. And, Mm -hmm. We lose our health, right. our physical safety if we're out on the streets, um, our mental faculties if we're out there long enough. Maybe even, you know, we, we're forced to resort to, you know, terrible means to survive. And just to say that all of that is freedom is just ridiculous. Absolutely. And like these same people, sorry, uh, like those same oh, people, um, I guess like the classical economists or like the Mont Pelerin guys in Chicago school and George Mason University and all those kind of guys, 
people like Ludwig von Mises and Ooh, James yeah. Buchanan and uh-huh. you know Hayek and Friedman and oh, all the all yeah. Sewell, all the terrible people. They yes. just can't seem to savvy onto that anyone would work on their own without being starved into it. They yeah. just starve us because they think it's more efficient. Maybe I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, it, it also is a means of control. In control, yeah, you, yeah you, absolutely. If you pretend that, well, if you don't like it here, you can go work someone else or somewhere else for a different master, and somehow that's a meaningful choice. If you pretend that that's what you're giving to your your workers, um, then you can kind of trap them into the idea that, well, I, I guess you know it's going to be one one boss or the other. There, there's no other possibility, um, and you can just keep squeezing as much as you can into your own pockets from, from the product of their labor. Yeah, abs- absolutely. And I, I'm, I guess, well, I don't know. Do you want to play a little m- more? Or do you want me to like jump? Cause I, I just wanted to comment on the next part that we were like the sure. next, I don't even know, 30 seconds. Sure. Yeah. Well, we can go over another 30 seconds and okay. pause again. Without the whip, the Negro will not work. Said oh. the anti-abolitionist free from their master's supervision. The serfs will leave the fields uncultivated. Said the Russian surf owners. It was the refrain of the French noblemen in 1789, the refrain of the Middle Ages, a refrain as old as the world, and we shall hear it every time there is a question of sweeping way and injustice. And each time, the actual facts give it the lie. The liberated peasant of 1792 plowed with a wild energy unknown to his ancestors. The emancipated Negro works more than his fathers, and the Russian peasant, after having honored the honeymoon of his emancipation by celebrating Fridays as well as Sundays, has taken up work with as much eagerness as his liberation was the more complete. Yeah, that it's it's the same sorts of, of uh, arguments they've they've always been making. You know, the the idea that with without this stick sort of motivational system that people would just laze around and society would collapse. And and as you said, that's just insanity. Uh, Pre-civilization, when people lived in in bands and tribes of like, you know, 30 to to 50 people, there were no such thing as jobs necessarily. It's not like you applied for a job and you you showed up. There was no contract and and it wasn't necessarily slavery. Slavery didn't necessarily exist in those systems either. And yet we survived for tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of years, uh, just fine. With, without the the uh, direct threat of a, of an owner saying work or 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 I will starve you. I mean it, it it is human nature. I would say more than anything to contribute to want to work. Like it's it's just such a myth, and and you push back on any of these myths that capitalists use to keep the system propped up and to keep themselves at top, at the top, and they just deflate immediately. All it takes is a little bit of thought, and you're like, well, yeah, that doesn't really make any sense. Yeah, yeah, I agree. And Kropotkin, he he wrote this, that this this lie is a refrain that we will hear every time there is a, like, like a question of whether we should or can, or, yeah, whether we should or we can, like, sweep away an injustice. Mm-hmm. Right. Every time you say there's an injustice, we want to stop it. The same lie is thrown out there. And he was right. Mm-hmm. And he's been right for, like I said, 130 years. Yeah. It's crazy. And especially like when those injustices, they make somebody or some small group of people insanely wealthy. Yeah. And it's and it's not just like the slave masters or surf owners anymore. It's mm-hmm. the workers, too. This like the serfs themselves, ourselves, because mm-hmm. I want to include myself here. Yeah, we've all been forced. We've all been forced to like listen to this propaganda our entire lives, Absolutely. and it's really, really hard to shake stuff like that off. And you know, and we shouldn't, but we shouldn't blame each other for that. Sure, absolutely. In my opinion, at least, it, it's hard to shake like your entire upbringing and education off of you. It's really difficult. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And and it's hard to imagine things that that I mean, you just never have imagined. I, I don't know a better way of putting it, but it, if you haven't had any examples of, of what could be, if, if no one has dared to dream past 
the the current situation, the current arrangement of of worker and and uh, owner, and and you haven't been exposed to those, those ideas, it's it's difficult to just come to that on your own. I mean, yeah. For, oh, sorry. Go ahead. I was just going to say, if for no other reason, because you're being forced to work all the time, like you don't have a lot of time to even consider that there's there's another possibility. Go, uh, yeah, go ahead. that's right. And, and you were just making me think of, have you heard that term uh, capitalist realism? Yes, I, I read that book, uh, Mark okay. Fisher's book recently. Yeah, it's it's very right. good. I, I highly recommend it. Name. And, uh, you know, it was basically like the, I guess the, the core thing that people repeat from that is, I haven't read the book, so tell me if this is wrong, sure. is that uh, it's easier to imagine the end of the world than the end of capitalism. Yep, you nailed it. Yep. Right, and I mean, I think that's, kind of what you were getting at like it's really hard to imagine something when you've just been you know completely overwhelmed with one certain thing yeah for your entire life yeah yeah it's a, an analogy i like to use a lot of the time is it would be hard to explain to a fish that it's living in water you know and that there was air and, th and that there was an entire world beyond the the the, the shiny shimmery surface yeah, for sure. Yeah. 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 Wow. And just getting back to the idea that, that they were still using the, or they started using the, these ideas to, to argue against the abolition of slavery as though if they weren't literally motivated by the whip that, that, uh, the, the black people in America who were enslaved would just, you know, crumble as a people. Would, would would not be able to put food on their table and provide for their own needs. It it really gets into the 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 uh, racist aspects of of some of these ideas that that and uh, and definitely the classist aspects of these ideas that these people are poor or 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 have have come into their lot in life because that's where they deserve to be. And without us, you know, brave strong leaders, without the Elon Musks. And the Jeff Bezos is of the world leading everyone, all these great men of history, then we would all be doomed. Uh, yeah, and and it's it's absolutely not true. Yeah, I agree. And the, the other part I find interesting, and I I imagine it must have been in his head at least a little bit, is that this was written pretty shortly after the uh, American Civil War. So maybe right. You know some of that, you know, war for war over slavery uh -huh. kind of crept over into Europe and had them thinking about it, or maybe the Haiti Revolution, which I know it happened before this, but I don't know precisely when. Maybe that was still kind of in the ether. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, the other thing uh, that I find interesting about Kropotkin was that he was he had these views after being born into a, like a wealthy aristocratic family. Mm -hmm. And then he was imprisoned for his beliefs. And then he mm -hmm. escaped somehow. Yeah. You know, ran across Asia and Europe and mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, it's just crazy that this guy got to the point where he was writing this book. It's just really amazing. Yeah. It, you know, from what I've read about people that, that knew him at the time, it sounds like he just had this like indomitable spirit. Like, like he was one of those people where he would go into any room and he would just kind of light it up and, and he'd be just bursting with ideas and, and, and just people were really attracted to him. And that, that that's really cool. I, I like having that as, as someone to kind of uh, not necessarily idolize, but definitely use as inspiration. I think that's, yeah. that's awesome. Very cool. All right. Starting to get some uh, uses in chat. Uh, own, own known. I don't know how to pronounce your username, but uh, yeah, I'm here. Hello, welcome to the chat. We're doing uh, the Conquest of Bread by Peter Kropotkin tonight. Doing listening to the audiobook, and we're pausing to to chat about it, just to catch you up to speed. So if you have any questions or anything, feel free to ask. Aren't always going to be able to pause it at every time you ask a question, but we'll we'll try and get to as many of your questions as we can. So thanks for joining us. I hope you like what you what you see and what you hear. All right. Um, all right. Uh, did you have more on this section or should we move on? Maybe just to say that sure. the idea that truly free men work harder than either slaves or wage earners seems pretty plainly obvious to me. Absolutely. I mean, 
what could motivate somebody more than freedom? Yeah, yeah. It's it's amazing how almost embarrassing, embarrassingly simple these these solutions are, and yet how powerful they are at the same time. Yeah, if you motivate people by uh, enfranchising them with with a democratic say in in the big decisions of their life, not just in in politics but also in the workplace, and then with the freedom to to have real choice about how they play out their life. Yeah, I, I would agree. That's going to be a huge motivator. To We could produce all kinds of amazing things that, that are not possible under this current system when so many people who otherwise would really flourish if they could just get into the right field or, or have access to the right tools or, or materials or, or other people, um, if not for the fact that they were uh, forced into this, this wage... Um, situation where they're, they're constantly having to scramble just to, to make ends meet. It's mm-hmm. amazing how much we probably have lost generation after generation, how many Einsteins have lived in, and died uh, toiling in a, in a cotton field or, or a, in a factory or whatever. Yeah, there was a, uh, were, were you going for that? Famous I, was, quote I was trying to yeah. approximate that quote. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I wish I remembered it too, because it's great. Like it really is. It's something like I'm less concerned with the size and the weight of Einstein's brain than how many uh, potential Einsteins have wasted away in like factories and jails or something like that. I, I think it's, I it's think that's really about heavy. It, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I find I find a lot of inspiration from from that particular quote because, yeah, that's that's the side that they never talk about because of of that that capitalist myth that the best always rises to the top and that, and that they deserve their spot up there and, and the rest of us deserve our lot as well. Um, but, I mean, that, that if you, again, if you think about these things for even just a, a few minutes, you realize that's not the case. Everyone has, has worked a job with someone who is really good at what they do or, or had some, some towering passion that they, they just couldn't get the right means to, to pursue. Um, Everyone has worked a job where just by knowing the, the owner or being related to somebody or just being in the right place in the right time, the wrong person has been promoted. You know, the idea that yeah. there's any meritocracy at all in, in any country is, is just laughable if, if you stop to think about it for just a few seconds. Agreed. Cool. All right. Well, well shall we move on to the, the next yeah. section? Yeah, all absolutely. right. Let's do it. There, where the soil is his. He works desperately. That is the exact word for it. The anti-abolitionist refrain can be of value to slave owners as to the slaves themselves. They know what it is worth as they know its motive. Moreover, who but economists taught us that if a wage earner's work is but indifferent, an intense and productive work is only obtained from a man who sees his wealth increase in proportion to his efforts? All hymns sung in honor of private property can be reduced to this axiom. For it is remarkable that when economists wishing to celebrate the blessings of property show us how an unproductive, marshy, or stony soil is clothed with rich harvests when cultivated by the peasant proprietor, they in no wise prove their thesis in favor of private property. By admitting that the only guarantee not to be robbed of the fruits of your labor is to possess the instruments of labor, which is true, the economists only prove that man really produces most when he works in freedom when he has a certain choice in his occupations, when he has no overseer to impede him, and lastly, when he sees his work bringing in a profit to him and others who work like him, but bringing in nothing to idlers. This is all we can deduct from their argumentation, and we maintain the same ourselves. As to the form of possession of the instruments of labor, they only mention... So, this part where he's talking about um, that man really produces most when he works in freedom and, mm-hmm. you know, when he has certain choices. This is, you know, everything that he hit here is kind of one of the, I, I don't know if fallacy is the right word or contradictions. Right. And may, maybe it originated here in this book. I don't know. But even I kind of picked up on it on my own. Mm-hmm. And I, I'm not really all that bright. And I saw it. <laughs> I you wouldn't know? say that, but sure. And <laughs> an economist you know, points to a business owner in his t- top hat and tails and says, hey, look at that, you know, industrious chap over there. Mm-hmm. Look how he exploits his workers. Mm-hmm. But then points to the workers 
and says how inefficient they are. Yeah. You know, they must be more they must be more efficient, damn it. Mm -hmm. And then some crazy guy some like sociopath like Jeff Bezos, yeah. he, he starts gamifying his warehouses so much oh. that people are forced to pee in bottles and drivers oh, have yeah. to defecate in bags to meet, you know, that inhumane, that inhumane schedule. Right. And and there's still I would guarantee they're still less efficient than a person working on their own, you know, in their own fields and with their own machines and actually seeing the full returns of every cent of, you know, their value. I guess I would say that's yeah absolutely true and and it, it, it's it's amazing too that that like Amazon's solution to these sorts of problems is uh, to keep a closer eye on the workforce not to give them extra breaks not to say hey wait a minute it sounds like we have a problem people aren't even able to meet their bodily function needs uh, due to the schedule that we give them their 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 idea is to like track where the bag that, that someone pooped in came from so that they can go nail them and fire that person. Yep, yep. Put more cameras so you can catch them peeing in the bottle. Right. Rather than removing the reason that they're doing it. Right, right. Yeah, it's sick. It's deeply sick. And, and it's so deeply... It, it's made even more sick by the, the obscene wealth that, that Bezos could be distributing just a small fraction of and still be one of the wealthiest people in the world. Like, he could, he could cut his wealth in half and distribute it all to his his workers. I'm sure he would get a huge return on that investment as well. They, I mean, they, they'd be working their asses off if if you know even a fraction flowed to them. And yep. yet, it's it's never going to be enough for him. He's he's always just going to keep accumulating. Like like he's basically at this point in an economic black hole where wealth just traps gets trapped in him in one way or another uh, to the point where I you know. These billionaires, at some point, are going to suck up so much of it that there's not going to be enough to go back out into the economy, you know? Yeah, I mean, I don't even know how much of it is now Yeah, going back out into the economy. You right. know, you said black hole, like, things don't come out of black holes. Exactly. Well, and, and, and they don't come out of people like Bezos. Like, what does yeah. he even need all of that money for if it's just keeping on accumulating? Like, he could never spend that in, in multiple lifetimes. Um, well, well, you don't understand that his parents gave him a huge loan when he was twenty. Yeah, yeah, yeah. which 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 then <laughs> so proves all of that. Yeah, it proves just how much of a genius. Just like Elon Musk, who who family just happened to own a, an apartheid emerald mine, and and gave him tons of money to start up stuff. And He's oh, by the underdog. yeah, by the way, he didn't invent any of the stuff he takes credit for. That was all other people. His patents were very small and and, and trivial. But he paid other people to to invent stuff for him that he can then take credit for, or or like he bought Tesla. And then what did he do? Did he pay or sue to become a board, uh, founder? I think he sued. Yeah, it was like really even slimier than it's yeah it's than most it's crazy. I, I I had thought that he found that company. I thought he. I thought so it. too. And 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 he he he, you know, he accumulates his wealth by building up on that myth. He, he's no different than you know a Donald Trump in that respect. Like. If you just, it's, it's like the thing where you say, if you make the lie big and, and you tell it often enough, then people just start believing it just out of the fact. Oh, yeah, I heard that too. You know, all you have to yep. do is get a few corroborating stories of, of the same thing. And all of a sudden, you know, Trump is a self-made billionaire, or even though he may or may not even be a billionaire or have, have ever been. You know, Elon Musk is, is, is uh, the embodiment of Tony Stark. <laughs> even though he didn't really develop anything and certainly doesn't work on any of the, the projects that, that he likes to take credit for. You know, at least Tony Stark went out and like built part of the, the power systems that he put together or his power suits or, or any of the stuff that, that he, he built in the, in the comic books. Yeah, I do find it a little annoying that people think that Elon Musk is actually a rocket scientist. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 <laughs> no. I would be astounded to find that he knows anything about aerodynamics or payload equations or, or any of the stuff. He just wants to go to, to Mars. And I heard someone in, in another podcast put it pretty well when in, they're like, if you track Elon's entire career, his entire trajectory, it's all about isolating himself from the pores, you know, from the, the uh, tunnels underneath 
L.A. so that he can avoid having to look at, at people while he's stuck in traffic to to eventually getting up to the, the space station on Mars where he can just totally blow this planet and, and leave all the rest of us behind, like create a, a literal version of that, that movie Elysium where the, the rich people all just live completely off world. Yep. It's, a, it, yep. It's, it's sick that people worship him so much. Yeah, and you know the thing is that I don't necessarily care if people want to go to Mars or, you know, where whatever they want to do. Sure. But if you're going to Mars because Earth is kind of messed up and you think like it, whatever it's going to take to terraform Mars, right? Just do it here, man. I know, really. Like, like help help people out, because you know what? Even if there is a colony on Mars, like they uh-huh. bring up one of his tunnel machines up there and they you know, create a little city. It's just going to be wealthy people. Of course. Yeah. You and I aren't going. Well, un- unless we get to be one of the lucky few uh, indentured servants that, that are now going to be a thing on Mars, I'm sure. Hey, you know what? That's true, too. Or <laughs> we might get that $100 million Spotify contract. You never know. <laughs> you never know. <laughs> you never know. <laughs> uh, that's funny. But yeah. Yeah, I, I don't it, it and it's not even the individual billionaires themselves that that I'm really all that concerned with. It's it's more the myths that, that that keep them in place and keep getting more money and the system that that keeps rewarding this sort of antisocial behavior. Agreed. Yeah. Agreed. Yep. All right, well let's continue on in the book. Mention it indirectly in their demonstration as a guarantee to the cultivator that he shall not be robbed of the profits of his yield, nor of his improvements. Besides, in support of the thesis in favor of private property against all other forms of possession, should not the economists demonstrate that under the form of communal property, land never produces such rich harvests as when the possession is private? But it is not so. In fact, the contrary has been observed. Take, for example, a commune in the canton of Vaud in the wintertime, when all the men of the village go to fell wood in the forest, which belongs to them all. It is precisely during these festivals of toil that the greatest ardor for work and the most considerable display of human energy are apparent. No salaried labor, no effort of private owner can bear comparison with it. Or let us take a Russian village. Just want to pause real real quickly there because something came up in my mind. Um, It's not it's not a perfect example, but but it does make me think of of festivals like uh, Burning Man where you have a bunch of people that, uh, sure, they do pay a lot of money to go out into the desert. So it's, it, like I say, it's not a perfect example. But for, for better or worse, they, they're allowed to, to do whatever they want, really. And they create some pretty amazing artworks and, 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 and music shows and, and community out there when they're, when they're allowed to just do whatever, you know? And it doesn't fall apart. It doesn't, you know, devolve into... Um, like a a post-apocalyptic kind of dystopian situation, like a Mad Max sort of a thing. Yeah. It it, it somehow manages to to hold together just through the good will will of the people that are out there who are all working on any, any, you know, basically a common goal, which is is to to do art and enjoy music and and also do drugs and and that sort of thing. But basically just live in in the sort of community, sort of intentional community that they, they want to. So, yeah, yeah, that makes sense. But I, uh, when I think about Burning Man, because a lot of people, you know, use that as an example, Mm -hmm. um, I always think about just how long it is. Yeah. And finite. That's true. You know, I mean, there's a definite endpoint. Right. And I always kind of think about it like if you meet a new significant other and you're having a good time and spending some time with them in their house, and, but then you move in. Right. right, and and the difference between playing house and really living with somebody, mm-hmm. living house, yeah. are, are quite different, you know. That's true. That's now, true. No, I don't know. Maybe it could continue for infinity. Uh-huh. You know, I don't know, but just I always, I always just feel like having that. You know, it it ends on whatever date. Right. Clean your shit up, or sorry, I, I don't know if you allow swearing on that, here. That's okay. Your stuff no up, problem. <laughs> clean your stuff up and leave it how you found it, and go home. Right. You know, it's quite different than you're living here forever. That's true. I, I was just kind of try to keep that in mind. No, yeah, yeah I, I do appreciate that, you know, tempering that with, with a little bit of reality. That, that's definitely true, that it isn't forever. So, 
But uh, that doesn't mean that, that an intentional community based no. around the principles of this book wouldn't be at least a worthwhile experiment. Because yeah, you, you, may, you, know, you may find the same thing would actually happen in reality. You know, it could be that people keep to their ideals and, and keep the sense of community going for a while, but then, then things see, deteriorate. If, or, or someone comes in and, and just sweeps it all away with their big army that doesn't care that you're yep. trying to live a better life. You know, that's a, that's definitely possible. That doesn't well, mean. We can be, oh, go we ahead. Can stay positive. We can yeah, stay we can positive. stay positive and, and, <laughs> and we can experiment with things. You know, that's that's the whole thing. You, you're never going to yep. get past this this uh, this capitalist reality if you don't, you know, at least try something different. Yeah, so. for sure. Absolutely. All right. Let's continue on. Village, when all its inhabitants mow a field belonging to the commune or farm by it, there you will see what a man can produce when he works in common for communal production. Comrades vie with one another in cutting the widest swath. Women bestir themselves in their wake so as not to be distanced by the mowers. It is a festival of labor in which a hundred people do work in a few hours that would not have been finished in a few days had they worked separately. What a sad contrast compared to the work of the isolated owner. In fact, we might quote scores of examples among the okay. pioneers. Of sure, go ahead. Um, so, yeah, I just really liked all of these examples he used right. from, you know, the village and, and the, uh, you know, the communal production and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it all rings true to me. Yeah. And a community coming together, you know, to help each other and by proxy to help themselves mm -hmm. is really a, you know, a wonderful thing. And I also think it's important to you know, think about, and I don't really remember if Kropotkin mentions this in this chapter or, mm -hmm. you know, really at all, but the co the commons, the common right. ownership of the land and the woods and, you know, everything else, the fields, right. it incentivizes the commune, the community itself to really care for it, right? you know, to, to replant trees, um, I don't know, clear the forest floor, to leave some trees standing and stuff like that, you mm -hmm. know, not to just clear cut everything. Right. Um, you know, I don't know anything about forestry or land management, by the way, but, you know, these people most likely would. Yeah, yeah, you would hope so, living yeah. there and doing that work. Yeah, yeah, that, that's a really good point. And uh, the, the, the counter argument that the capitalists always make is that, well, it's, it's the tragedy of the commons. Like if it just mm -hmm. becomes a free for all, then someone's going to come in and just take it all and, and not care. And I mean, there is truth to that because that is what they would do. For sure. I mean, that is what yep. they do in places like, you know, global fisheries that are in international waters. They, they do take whatever they can because the, 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 thing, the thing they never talk about, though, the, th the thing they never mention is that that's because they can get a short term profit for themselves and then go somewhere nicer. If you're talking about people that are going to stay on the land and, and have to live with the consequences of their action, they're going to have a much bigger incentive to manage things wisely and not allow people to come in and just take, 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 and then just leave because they can. Agreed. Cool. All right. Well, let's keep going. All right. Of America in Swiss, German, Russian, and certain French villages, or the work done in Russia by gangs or tells of masons, carpenters, boatmen, fishermen, etc., who undertake a task and divide the produce or the remuneration among themselves, without it passing through the intermediary or middlemen. We could also mention the great communal hunts of nomadic tribes and an infinite number of successful collective enterprises. And in every case, we could show the unquestionable superiority of communal work compared to that of the wage earner or the isolated private owner. Well-being, that is to say, the satisfaction of physical, artistic, and moral needs has always been the most powerful stimulant to work. And when a hireling produces bare necessities with difficulty, a free worker who sees ease and luxury increasing for him and for others in proportion to his efforts, spends infinitely far more energy and intelligence and obtains first-class products in far greater abundance. The one feels riveted to misery, the other hopes for ease and luxury in the future. And this lies the whole secret. Therefore, a society aiming at the well-being of all and at the possibility of all enjoying life in all its manifestations, will supply voluntary work which will be infinitely superior and yield far more than work has produced up until now under the goad of slavery, serfdom, or wagedom. Yeah. Part two. Oh, 
before we get to part two. <laughs> we'll just pause it there. Yeah, I think that's a, that's a really good point that he, he's saying is, is that once you start getting these sorts of examples in, in real life, once you have something that you can point to and say, well, why don't we do it like them? Then it just becomes kind of a cascading effect where, you know, you, you produce people that are happier in their, their job. They're able, as they naturally spread out into the world, to, to go and, and, and organize things in, in that better way wherever they go and, and, and start building up uh, new um, test cases there. And, and it's just something, it's, it, it's again, it's like having that, that example to look at where, as before, you, you couldn't even think beyond what you have, you know, so. Yeah, uh, yeah, I agree. And I just really loved his use of language here mm-hmm. when he said, uh, well, I, I guess, you know, I just loved how he talked about the hired worker being described as riveted, riveted to misery. Yeah, riveted to misery. <laughs> That's a good turn of phrase. Yeah, and and that the free worker is full of hope and aiming at well-being rather than you know the mere you know base survival that the wage worker is. Mm-hmm. And, and then the concept that uh, a a society that aims to help everybody or mm-hmm. even as many as they as humanly possible that they would rely on workers working voluntarily mm-hmm. rather than under you know duress and force and <laughs> and oppression. And I feel like I'm just repeating myself kind of, but yeah, I just agree a hundred percent. The yeah. work is better. It's more efficient. It yields greater results and the workers are more happy. Right. And that means that society is more happy. Well, and, and, and you're spending so much less uh, time, money, energy on trying to motivate people through the, through all these, these, these elaborate schemes of, of, of threatening them and, and, you know, trying to scare them with, with horror stories of, of people that have tried to do what they want to do, like especially in the case of like people that are trying to unionize. You know, they could be, they could be saving all of those meetings that, that, that workers are forced to go to, all of those scare tactics. You know, when, when uh, that one Amazon uh, warehouse was trying to unionize lately, it, it's, it's incredible the lengths that Amazon went to to meddle with that. You know, they, they, they put up the, the collection box they had the post office move the collection box for all the ballots on site so that they could yep. see who's putting ballots in there. They, they went to the city engineers to, to change the, the uh, rhythm of the stoplight so that people wouldn't stop as they're leaving work so that no one could talk to them about unionizing. All this time and money and effort that's just wasted. Whereas if you, if you flip that on its head and you have people motivated by being free and, and doing meaningful work that they like, you, you do away with all that inefficiency, all that waste, all the, all the supposed efficiencies that, that capitalism brings uh, that, that are shown not to be once you, once again, once you look at them for, you know, more than a few seconds. Yeah. And there was another interesting thing about that Amazon drive. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> Sorry about that. Uh, no problem. The Amazon drive and the response, like Amazon's response to it. Right. And th- like one of them was, like the workers are driven to the point where they can't go to the bathroom. Yeah. But all of a sudden every week there's multiple half hour, hour long meetings that they can all sit in and not be, not be moving. Right. Yeah. Right. So you, you, you know, you can't, you can't urinate on one end, but then when Amazon wants something, uh-huh. it's just, no, there's we'll all the time the in the world. down, come sit in this office. Yeah. You know, so obviously what they're doing is ridiculous. Yeah. And they spent tens of millions of dollars. I know. With private companies Mm -hmm. to basically dox their workers Mm -hmm. and convince them and just run, you know, psyops on them. Right. To get them to vote no. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It it is really incredible the lengths that they, they will go to. And, you know, I'm sure it works out for the owners in the long run. They, they do end up getting, that that to retain their their cherished seat at the top and, and just suck as much as they can from from the bottom. Um, yeah, but it's not e- it's not even about the seat at the top. They were going to have that anyway. Mm-hmm. It's the seat at the top plus an extra one percent more money. Right. Yeah. 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 Just just a few more decimal points over on on the spreadsheet at the end of the day. 
Oh, it's so sorry. I get I get worked up sometimes. I I it's, totally it's understand. Really it's 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 <laughs> sick what they do just to to I mean, and they're so scared of of workers ever getting together and collectively organizing because they know that they wouldn't have as much power. And and if they didn't have as much power, well, maybe the workers are going to want to take more and a little bit more until they become the owners. I think I mean, that's really why they go to these great lengths, in, in my opinion, is because they are deathly afraid of, you know, maybe maybe they think that things are just going to turn on its head and that they'll all be the new owners and they'll force Bezos to go to like work in the the, the warehouses or whatever. But but whatever it is, I think that that mortal fear is what really drives these these sickening lengths that they go to and and you're right it when they when they have time to do meetings that that shows the lie of not being able to have enough and and we right. see again with some of these these fast food chains starting to offer higher wages uh that they could have done so all along they're they're just trying to to scare you into uh having to choose between starvation and, and working for their brutal conditions. Yeah. Yeah. They McDonald's spent my, at least my entire life telling us that they couldn't pay us any, any more than minimum wage mm-hmm. or else it would close. Right. And now you have McDonald's offering $18 an hour in some places. Yeah. 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 And I, I think that's only their, their corporate sites, but that doesn't, I mean, that's really beside the point. It shows that all of them could, even the franchises, I'm yeah. sure. And they could have all along. They were just lying so that they can squeeze more out of, out of people that have <laughs> virtually nothing to begin with. Yep. Yeah, it's not even like squeeze more out of. It's prevent them from getting. Right. Oh, well, at yeah. That point, that, 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 that's a good point. That, that's a better way of framing it. They're, they're taking the, more of their surplus value than. Yeah, minimum wage you know, workers could. are wrung out. Oh, absolutely. They are dry. Absolutely. Is it, McDonald's is just trying not to give them anything. That, 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 that's totally true. I, I worked for Panera for like three and a half years or so. And some days, just because things would be kind of slow, I would try and keep track of the, the amount of sales that, that passed through my register. And it would be thousands, tens of thousands of dollars, and, and especially if you count up all the different registers. And they're just squeezing out, you know, nine, ten dollars an hour for, for each one of us that, that sat up there and worked for them. Yep. And and you could you could explain away some of it from like needing to have managers or, or marketing or, or you know, buy inventory, future investments, all that sort of thing. But I'm I'm absolutely certain that once you settled all of those balance books, you know, the vast majority of what I was producing for them was going to the right to the very top. Yeah, I think if you Googled the net worth of the Panera CEO, mm-hmm. you'd see where it all went. Yeah, absolutely true. Absolutely true. You know. Yep. All right. Um, yeah, I think we should uh, keep moving on. We're making pretty good time. We're, we're about halfway through where we want to be, and we've done about an hour so far. So, yeah, we're keeping on a good pace. Okay, cool. Nowadays, whoever can load on others his share of labor indispensable to existence does so, and it is admitted that it will always be so. Now work indispensable to existence is essentially manual. We may be artists or scientists, but none of us can do without things obtained by manual work. Bread, clothes, roads, ships, light, heat, etc. And moreover, however highly artistic or however subtly metaphysical are our pleasures, they all depend on manual labor. And it is precisely this labor basis of life that everyone tries to avoid. We understand perfectly well that it must be so nowadays, because to do manual work now means in reality to shut yourself up for 10 or 12 hours a day in an unhealthy workshop and to remain riveted to the same task for 20 or 30 years and maybe for your whole life. It means to be doomed to a paltry wage, to the uncertainty of the morrow, to want of work, often to destitution more often than not to death in a hospital, after having worked 40 years to feed, clothe, amuse, and instruct others than yourself and your children. I mean... Can we pause? Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. So when I... You know, I read this book. I was probably about 20. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Man, I wish I read uh, this at 20, I got to (laughs) say. Honestly, though, I found it interesting, but it didn't really hit home. Hmm. Okay. Then, Interesting. Um, and I'm just 
because you know when we scheduled this, I said, well, I'm going to have to read at least chapter 12. Mm -hmm. So I read it, and this part here, this beginning of section two, mm -hmm. it all hurts because that's my life. <laughs> I'm, I'm in the, it, the exact it, same boat, yes. And it has been for you know my entire life, my entire adult life at least. Mm -hmm. You know, I work a lot of hours every single week. Mm -hmm. I don't like it. I'm chained. So for people who don't know, my job is I drive a, like a semi, an 18 wheeler. Oh, I'm a delivery driver myself. Oh, OK. So that's my day job. And I'm chained to a giant machine for 10 to 12 hours a day, mm -hmm. just like Kropotkin was saying here. Mm -hmm. And I've been chained to that same task, at least for 24, 24 years now. Oh, wow. And it's it's slowly and surely breaking my body down as I do it. Mm -hmm. I know it. I feel it. You know, this chapter is it's my life being reflected back at me. And it sucks to see. It sucks to read it. You know, I, I'm literally living and dying. Chapter 12, Section 2 of The Conquest of Bread, which was written, like I said, 130 years ago. Yeah. And but I also know that I am far from alone. Oh, feeling, for sure. You know? Yeah, this this last passage, man, that really hit me hard, too. Because just as you said, that, that's basically been my adult life as well. Um, even though I, I have an advanced degree, um, I have my master's in urban planning, uh, just because of, of circumstances, I ended up not getting a job in the field. And, and so I've had to do uh, these other jobs instead. And, and yeah, it, it hasn't produced... Uh, all that much in the end, like I haven't netted all that much in the end. I don't, don't really have much savings to speak of. I don't really have, uh, you know, I, I'm dependent on my body to keep on working. And if that doesn't, if, if, if for whatever reason that gives out that that's, you know, that would be a bad situation for me. Um, and, and I think that that last passage really just lays out what capitalism can offer for the average person it, it just lays it pretty bare like you, you strip away all the, the the advertising the propaganda the 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 myths that that underpin the capitalist system and what you come down to is is people for the most part still just scraping by uh just having enough to to live breaking their body over the course of their lifetime and not having much left over when when they finally die and that's that's depressing. That's depressing that that's the best that, that they can offer. And they, they can try and, and, and fool all of us by dangling things like, well, you know, you may end up getting to be the owner one day, too. And then you, too, can to have millions. Or if you just work harder, it will it'll it'll pay off, you know. Yep. Uh, but yeah, it it, it 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 happens the way that it's just described way too often for it to be coincidence or for it to be something essential about workers uh, or your yeah. average worker yeah those uh whatever five or six paragraphs they just kind of strip the veneer right off of everything absolutely and it, it it really when i read it i was just like damn <laughs> yeah yeah it really hits you yeah. it really hits you <sighs> yeah but they, there's there's always one more thing they can dangle in front of you though to to try and keep you going um, yeah well i'm yeah, I mean, you know what? It's often it's just survival. Mhm. Mm is what they're dangling. They're not dangling a new Porsche. Right. They're saying like where are you going to go? You don't have anything. Right. Yeah. We've got enough we've got enough here to get you through the next week. Right. So you stay. Yeah. Yep. Yep, you you take that completely uneven agreement, if you want to even call it an agreement in in your employment. I don't. I wouldn't I wouldn't either. <laughs> like <laughs> You know, I, I always like to say if if there's not an, a meaningful alternative, then there's you don't have a choice. You're being forced into it one way or another. And the, the absolute best that they can offer, you know, I, I used to waste my time arguing on Facebook with with capitalists about what they believe. Um, and they would always come back and say, well, why don't you just uh, start your own business? Just become an owner yourself. As if that's an easy thing to do, first of all. But even putting that aside, assuming that was something that any, just anyone can do. For one thing, someone still has to be your workers. It's, it's a pyramidal shape 
That's what every organization is. You have to have more workers below you. So it couldn't work out for everyone, right. you know, right. unless yeah, everyone's exactly. an independent contractor who's charging $100 an hour or whatever. But that's not yeah. realistic. And then number two, the best you can offer me is, is instead of getting rid of an exploitive system to just become the exploitive system, become another, another cog in the ex- exploitation of other people, I don't want to exploit other people. I, don't, I wouldn't feel good at the top, you know, doling out crumbs when, when I'm taking the whole loaf for myself. Yep. So, so, yeah, when it comes down to it, capitalism can't really offer all that rosy of a picture to, to most people. Yep. <sighs> all right. Um, did you have anything else you want to say about that? or, or should we? Uh, no, I think we can go on. All right. Let's do it means to bear the stamp of inferiority all your life because whatever the politicians tell us the manual worker is always considered inferior to the brain worker and the one who has toiled 10 hours in a workshop has not the time and still less the means to give himself the high delights of science and art nor even to prepare himself to appreciate them he must be content with the crumbs from the table of privileged persons we understand that under these conditions Manual labor is considered a curse of fate. We understand that pause? all men have but Sure, go ahead. Okay, so I'm, I might get a little long-winded here. No problem. <laughs> so this last part, the, the stamp of inferiority stuff and the inferiority of, uh-huh. what, you know, I guess what we'd call blue-collar work nowadays mm-hmm. compared to white-collar work, this hits home pretty hard too. Yeah, absolutely. And you, you know how... I guess every once in a while on like Facebook or whatever, there will be some meme about, you know, like a mother telling her kids not to be like that guy. Oh yes. You know, the garbage, the garbage man worker, or the usually person yeah. or mechanic or whatever, the greasy guy. Right. Or maybe just a story about a mother or father saying something like you need to stay in school. So you don't end up like that person, you know, the right. janitor or whatever. I've been that person in real life mm-hmm. with people Me saying too. that stuff, you know, in, in fact, I even had a friend and who met one of my work friends. And when that work friend left, also a truck driver, who was a truck driver at the time, uh, my friend said something like, yeah, but all he'll ever be is just a truck driver. Oh. With just like this utter disdain in his voice. Oh, that's so cruel. And then when he saw my face, he said, not you, though. Oh, oh yeah. You know, but it was me. Uh-huh. Somewhere, somewhere in there. They felt that way about me as well. Oh, of course. Hurt. You know, so screw those crumbs from the privilege that Kropotkin talks Absolutely. about. Absolutely. You know, I want the whole meal. Right. We all deserve a good <laughs> meal. You know, and I'm that that whole attitude that a lot of people have annoys me because the world needs people mm-hmm. to do stuff like that. They need, like you were saying earlier about picking up garbage. You need people to do that. Mm-hmm. And those and those people. They should probably own the means of production, right? Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Or at, or at least at least own the companies that they work for. For sure. they're doing that job. There's no at reason the they couldn't, yeah. Least, you know? And that's it. Yeah. I, I totally agree with that. And, and the thing of it is, is it, it's really easy to internalize that, that sort of narrative that, you know, all Absolutely. you'll ever be is, is X job. I, I've definitely felt that myself when I was working at Panera, you know, it was a few years uh, out of college and I hadn't found a job in my field yet. Um, and from time to time, people I knew would come in. It was in my hometown uh, and I would feel embarrassed. I would feel ashamed. And they, they would say they would be embarrassed for me and they would say things like, you know, oh, you know, I, I know plenty of people that, that are, are still trying to find their feet or whatever, you know. Gee, thanks. Yeah. <laughs> Gee, thanks. Um, but yeah, it's really easy to internalize that. Um, so what, I think one of the, the best ways to turn that all around is, is reading theory like this and, and seeing, no, th- this is all a lie. Everyone has value. You know, my, even my job at, at, at Panera. Sure, someone else could have done it. That, that's, that's not the point, though. I was doing it. I was, yeah. I was bringing in that uh, that, that surplus at the end of the day, I was contributing and I was contributing to society. I was feeding people, you know, through my job. Um, there should be dignity in all work. There's not a single job that's, 
unnecessary. And if it is, well, maybe we can, as a, as a society, decide that and then not make anyone do it, <laughs> not force anyone the indignity of doing something that, that nobody actually values. Right. Yeah. 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 A- absolutely. I agree. Cool. All right. Let's keep going. One dream that of emerging from or enabling their children to emerge from this inferior state to create for themselves an independent position, which means what? To also live by other men's work. As long as there will be a class of manual workers and a class of brain workers, black hands and white hands, it will be thus. What interest, in fact, can this depressing work have for the worker when he knows that the fate awaiting him from the cradle to the grave will be to live in mediocrity, poverty, and insecurity of the morrow? Therefore, when we see the immense majority of men take up their wretched task every morning, we are surprised at their perseverance, at their zeal for work, at the habitat that enables them, like machines blindly obeying an impetus given, to lead this life of misery without the hope for the morrow, without foreseeing ever so vaguely that some day they, or at least their children, will be part of a humanity rich in all the treasures of a bountiful nature, in all the enjoyments of knowledge, scientific and artistic creation, reserved today to a few privileged favorites. It is precisely to put an end to the separation between manual and brain work that we want to abolish wage them, that we want the social revolution. Then work will no longer appear a curse of fate. It will become what it should be, the free exercise of all the faculties of man. Moreover, it is time to submit to... Sure. Um, so I think that the point here as I took it mm-hmm. is important to think about and to really dig into like wherever we can do it. Mm -hmm. I I think that Kropotkin is saying that, you know, we have, we have one dream or, or goal and that's to escape exploitation. Right. And literally everybody I know who has tried to start, you know, going back to you starting a business or Mm -hmm. um, not you starting a business, but we're talking about starting a business to get out of the, you you know, being, to get out of the, the, yeah. You know, they did it for that reason. Mm-hmm. They started the business to escape being exploited. Mm-hmm. And even if they didn't, you know, necessarily phrase it that way, because most of my friends probably wouldn't, mm-hmm. that's what they were doing. Absolutely. But when you do that, you escape exploitation by becoming an exploiter. Right. You know, it's like, it's like, I, I guess there's an, an old uh, comparison that people would say it's like telling a slave to escape slavery by owning their own slaves i was just gonna say the same thing yeah you know and then when he talks about the surprise we feel when we see everyone march to their jobs and grind themselves down with no hope for a better future and all that it it, it actually kind of mirrors an episode that i did on work uh-huh um it, it's just like we're, we're, we're forced into this state of like zombie-like slavery to this wage system and we don't even see a payoff at the end. We just keep mm-hmm. marching. Yeah. And the only prescriptive out of, you know, the exploitation here is to become the exploiter. It's just right. It's just sick. Yeah. It's bad. It's terrible. It it, it absolutely is. Um there was a there was a recent debate between uh Professor Richard Wolf um and Destiny, who's a, a he calls himself an omni liberal. I don't think that term actually has meaning, but anyway, he's he's basically a, a capitalist. Yeah, um, I'm not really familiar with. I, I know who he is, but I, I love Wolf. Yeah, 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 yeah. I was I was going to talk about Wolf. We can <laughs> we can leave Destiny aside because he didn't okay. really contribute anything <laughs> other than being you know that one kid in every college class who's taken who's like read a, a philosophy book and now he knows everything about it and he's going to tell the professor how it is. Uh, but anyway, so so Wolf lays out the various economic systems. He, he's he's defining what socialism is. So first, he he lays out what has come before socialism, and he goes through slavery, which is a a master slave relationship. He goes through um, feudalism, which is a lord and serf. You you don't have the 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 threat of death, but you have a a situation where you have to you know. Uh, pledge your fealty to the the Lord, and you know, in return, they take some of your crops, and you take the rest. And then, moving forward in time, you get to capitalism, where you have, and what what, what defines capitalism is the the worker and owner relationship. Things are 
quote unquote voluntary, where you can decide to have a contract with any employer who's offering work. Um, and then you get compensated based on the, the terms of that contract and they take the rest. And so that what socialism is, is, is moving beyond all of that, getting rid of these, these imbalances in worker and owner relationships or, or e exploiter exploited relationships and moving finally to everyone being the owner of their own enterprise, everyone uh, collectively making decisions, uh, democratizing the workplace, basically. And, you know, I thought that was a really good way of, of, of putting it. That, that just kind of lays everything out as in a way that you can see how, how revolutionary the, these sorts of ideas actually are, because it's something that's never really happened um, as the dominant form on Earth before. But it's something that if it did happen would be so completely different than than what we have now it's it's again it's hard to even imagine yeah yeah so. I, yeah 100 percent. cool all right uh let's let's keep going okay to a serious analysis this legend about superior work supposed to be obtained under the lash of wagedom it is enough to visit not the model factory and the workshop that we find now and again but the ordinary factories to conceive the immense waste of human energy that characterizes modern industry. For one factory more or less rationally organized, there are a hundred or more which wastes man's labor without a more substantial motive than that of perhaps bringing in a few pounds more per day to the employer. Here you see youths from 20 to 25 years of age sitting all day long on a bench, their chests sunken in, feverishly shaking their heads and bodies the tie with the speed of conjurers, the two ends of worthless scraps of cotton, the refuse of the lace looms. What progeny will these trembling and rickety bodies bequeath to their country? But they just as, as, as kind of a, a side note to, to what he was just talking about, um, it would be easy to just assume that uh, since we don't have child labor anymore, that, that that's a product of capitalism just naturally evolving and, and becoming better and through maybe even through democracy and regulation, things just getting better. But what that, what that would miss is the entirety of, of uh, counter-capitalist efforts, the labor unions, anarchists throughout history pushing to get these things you know, oftentimes dying or, or um, you know, causing riots or, or, or spilling blood in one way or another in order to get us to where we're at. So it's, 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 it's in spite of capitalism that we've managed to make these, these gains in the workplace, not, not because of it in any way. If capitalism had its way, it would still be today. You know, child labor would yeah, be that, the norm. Yeah. There are people out there right now arguing that it should be that way. I, I don't know how those people, I, I don't, I don't, I cannot understand yeah, I, that at all. <laughs> yeah, I don't either. I mean, they might not, they might be few and far between. Sure. They're just loud, but just that they exist and they, that they, that they argue this. Yeah. And that anyone even takes <sighs> them seriously. It's, yeah, it's just gross. It, it really is gross. It really is gross. Um, I don't know how you could look at, at any kids and, and think they'd be better off breaking their body from the beginning and never Even having any rest. Mine. Yeah, yeah, go down to that coal mine. Oh, you got those little hands. You can work that machine better. Uh, uh, it's just it's just sick. Yeah. And it's just it's it's such a devaluation of human life. Yeah. Yep. Absolutely. Uh, especially it's with the, modified. Yeah, oh, and especially with yeah. the revolution in automations or the revolutions in automation that we've had. You know why wouldn't that be a better alternative to to even these 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 lower labor jobs you know or lower yeah. lower valued labor jobs why is that yeah, not it, what we're pushing instead yeah, it never seems to work out though right be, well, you because know, the more they automate the more the more input you need to feed into those machines and it's uh -huh. just a, a terrible cycle yeah you know like the, the cotton gin it just resulted in more slaves absolutely because they needed more cotton they could process more cotton you know? right yeah, you can put more land under under production. Yep, and uh, yeah, be, because the the new innovations always end up being owned by somebody. That that's mm -hmm. going to be 
the 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 capitalist owners in in that sort of a, a framework. But if everyone was an owner in a certain enterprise, then you certainly would get better. Um, there certainly would be an incentive to uh, to automate or, or to make uh, processes more yielding, I, I should say. Um, and then it would and then it would benefit everyone who was still a worker, assuming that their job was not um, done away with. But that would be something that you would at least be able to have a say in. You know, right. you're not just going to show up one day at, at your fast food job to find a a um, machine in your place. You know, a little a little punch screen or whatever to get your burgers. Uh, let's see. Banana more. Thank you very much for the follow. I, I hope you like right, what you're right. seeing tonight. Um, we are talking about The Conquest of Bread by Peter Kropotkin. It's it's one of the foundational anarcho-communist texts. And we're just going through the audiobook tonight. Uh, my, my guest tonight is Sean of the Tribunus Plebis. I, I always have trouble saying that name. I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing your podcast that's, name. That's okay. Everybody does. Yeah. yeah. Sorry. It, I, you know, when I made the podcast, I was trying to figure out how to pronounce Plebis. 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 Yeah. I, yeah, I got to keep that's remembering That's how I that. say it. Okay. But you can find about 40 different pronunciations, but Plebis seems to be probably about 70% of the pronunciations i found were that so i went with it cool well <laughs> i mean it is it definitely is a memorable name you know well, good. It, it, it sticks out there and and it, it means tribune of the people right yes yeah that, that's really cool I, I like how you've put that together oh, thank you so anyway um did you have did you have anything more to say about this particular part i kind of got sidetracked uh, for a second yeah, no, I will in a little bit, though. Okay, okay, let's yeah. let's move on to that part. They occupy okay. so little room in the factory, and each of them brings me six pence a day, will say the employer. In an immense London factory, you could see girls, bald at 17 from carrying trays of matches on their heads from one room to another, when the simplest machine could wield the matches to their tables. But it costs That's so sick. little. The work of women who have no special trade. What is the use of a machine? When these can do no more, they will be easily replaced. There are so many in the street. On the okay, steps of the mansion. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, so that that's the part I wanted to hear sure. before I before I was talking. Um so when I I guess like when I hear examples like the string tying and the trays of matches and mm -hmm. you know, I don't even really know what the heck he's talking about, honestly. <laughs> Because this yeah. book is so old, that right? It, you know that all that stuff has fallen into the past, sort of. But mm -hmm. I, but I definitely get where he's coming from. You know, and I can't help but think of automation, like you were talking about a little mm -hmm. ways back. And I want automation. Yeah, I, I pretty firmly believe that workers should be replaced by robots whenever they can be and set free. Sure. You, you know, not just shunted into the next industry that can exploit them, but actually set free, like Absolutely. we've been talking about the freedom. But, you know, in these examples, um, he's talking about, like, physical harms of work. Mm -hmm. But we also have, like, like mental, emotional, and, and, like, spiritual destruction as well to deal yes. with. And how the owners of the capital say, why shouldn't I destroy these people who have no skill? Right. A and by this, they're essentially calling these human beings worthless or you know, they're, they're throwaways, mm -hmm. you know, why should he automate something when he can just sacrifice these, you know, basically pack animals for much, yeah. you know, it's really depressing. It really <laughs> is. It's horrifying. <laughs> yeah. But this exact same math is happening in every corporation mm -hmm. right now from like McDonald's to United technologies and, mm -hmm. um, seven 11 to Raytheon. They're Absolutely. making these exact same equations right now. And I, and I, I literally think I mean that literally. They yeah. are right now somewhere in some offices running these numbers. And Absolutely. they are deciding that hurting people is cheaper. Mm hmm. That, that's absolutely true. I, I, Amazon is, is another really good example Amazon. of that. Yeah, Amazon. The, we were just talking about it. Right. They, 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 they have calculated things so precisely that that um I've, I've heard stories of this where you you, ha you have the scanner you're running around to different bins to to fill these orders 
and they have it down to where there's a counter on yep. your, your scanner and it doesn't stop. It doesn't stop if you cut yourself and you need to go get a Band-Aid. It doesn't, cut your, it, it doesn't stop if you have to go to the bathroom. It doesn't stop if the thing in your bin that's supposed to be there is not there. Mm-hmm. And, 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 and the, like the procedures that these people have to go through, at the time it was like you, you'd have to scan every single item in the bin to prove to the, the machine that it wasn't there and that you weren't just being a lazy worker. Mm. It's, 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 it's sickening how, yeah. how minutely they have all of this stuff laid out to make people function as they were machines. Yeah, and I actually have a Amazon story. Oh, you do? Yeah. Um, I was there for my job uh-huh. delivering stuff, and I was standing in, like, when you're a driver, they have, like, a little, like, caged area that you can walk into so uh-huh. you don't go into the warehouse. Sure. And I was standing there waiting for somebody, and a guy was walking, and he just collapsed. Oh. He just fell right on his face. And some people were walking around, and I said, and I was like, hey, this guy is, just, you know, he just passed out. And they're like, yeah, yeah, we got it. But they just kept packing boxes. And I, and, and I was <sighs> like, isn't somebody going to help? Like, oh, yeah, we called somebody. I said, like, no, like somebody should be, there should be like five people over there. Yeah. And then, and then a guy Pretend came over that. with orange cones. And he put four orange cones oh. around this guy who was passed out on the ground. Oh, are you kidding? Oh. And then walked away. I mean, it sounds like it sounds like a cautionary tale in some dystopian sci-fi novel, or like a Dickens thing. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That that's another good example too. <laughs> you know. Yeah. Uh, one or oh. the other. I wonder what Dickens would have had to say about about our modern age. I'm sure he would have quite said, a lot. Of course. Of course. Of course. Yeah. He wouldn't be surprised right now. Oh, I don't think so. Yeah. He'd be uh, always uh, this. This will always be the plight of, of the working person. Yeah. It was. That was. A, a, a very sad scene. It was terrible. And the guy God, ended up getting up. Shocking. He was okay. You know, I, I don't know what happened to him, if he just passed out from the heat or whatever. But it was still just, yeah, it was shocking. It was shocking to see people who I'm sure some of them knew the guy. Uh-huh. Their friend or their coworker lay in, and nobody helped them. And mm-hmm. we've had people hurt at my place. And everything stops. Yeah. You know, and they're like, oh, my God, is he okay? Is she okay? And, you know, make sure everybody's all right and get them off the dock. And, and then you go back to work. Yeah, there's You don't the, just, you don't put cones around somebody. Put cones. And with ignore the, them. Man, it sounds like a punchline. <laughs> yeah, it, it sounds fake. It sounds like something somebody would make up to make a, comp, a corporation seem evil. Uh-huh. But, but I, I, I totally but believe evil. that that is what happened. Yeah, they definitely are. They definitely are. Wow. Wow, that's crazy. <laughs> uh, it's ta- it's ta- I'm taken aback quite a bit here from that story. That's just, that's hard to process. Yeah. Yep. <sighs> and it's, 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 it's the idea that you're completely engineering out any sort of humanity from these people where they, they literally have to function as, as basically androids. Yeah, as robots. That's, that's so cruel. That's just yeah. so cruel. And and if if they don't, they they would just replace them all. You know, fire them that day. If yep. the numbers got behind. Ugh. That's yep. really gross. Okay, so we do have a a comment coming in from Banana Moore, and they say the work culture around Amazon is so hellish. LOL. Their workers need to be organized so badly. I absolutely could not agree more. Yeah, absolutely. That, that, that is, I mean, and that's the case of, of any workplace. I, I had, the, I had the, the good fortune one time in my life to, to work uh, for the Postal Service, and they are unionized across the country. And, you know, talk about coming into something that you've never even dreamed was possible before. I, I saw the difference that, that the union made. I saw that, like, you know, if, if I had done something wrong and I was called into the office, there was a union rep there in with me to make sure the the, the boss didn't do anything illegal. Yep. Um, I, I started right around uh, Christmas time, and it, it's it's the biggest, you know, part of the year for, for any delivery service. 
And those union reps worked hard to make sure that every time they pushed their, their carriers past what, they, what was in their contract, that they got penalized. And it wasn't a small penalty either. It would be like $100 a day for, for making them work past the hours that they were supposed to. And they made sure they got that. That's the, that's the difference that even having a union makes. Yep. And, and I've worked other delivery services. I'm at a different one right now. And it's completely different. You know, if, if something goes wrong, I don't have anyone who's on my side. You know, it, it's me against my manager. And I'm, I've been fortunate to have nice managers who, who actually do seem to care about me. But that's not going to be the case for everybody and in every situation. I've definitely had the opposite. I've had, pe- I've had managers that didn't give a crap about their, their workers. Um, and there was nothing that they could do. Just quit, basically. <laughs> Yeah, and I also think that I've had managers who really did care about the workers, mm-hmm. but when it came down to it, they had the other pressures. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. They bent to them because right. they also need food and shelter, and you know, there's there's no way to, there's no way to escape it. Right. Yeah. They they, they you know they, they will do what they can. That's it's part of being a, a effective manager anyway yep. is to yep. ingratiate yourself with the the people that are under you. Um, it's a lot easier than having to, to yell at them all the time for one thing. Uh, but then also if there is something like a union drive, then you're like, Oh, Hey, I thought we were buddies. You're not going to vote for that, uh, that terrible old union. Are you? They're just going to take half your paycheck, you know, and all this stuff. And yep. they'll, they will, they will turn on a dime and, and use, use that emotional connection to further the interests of the owner. They will, you know, that that's one thing you got to. If you ever are in a position, any of you listeners are in a position where you can get a, a union, where there is a union drive at your workplace, don't trust management. Don't trust them with anything. Don't don't talk to them, you know, if you, if you can help it, um, because they don't have your best interests in mind. They, yep. you know, legally, contractually, um, just the way things end up playing out, end up playing out that, that that's never going to be the case. Yeah, we had a union drive at my company. Mm. It ended up failing. That's but, that's uh, unfortunate. It it is it is, and one of one of the first tactics was, "Hey, we're family." Right, we're, we're family. family. Why would you want to put somebody in between us? <sighs> and I was like, "Man, you are not my family." <laughs> Absolutely, my family's at home. Uh huh. This is a business arrangement. You know, you're nothing to me. I mean, you are as a person. Right. But as my boss. No. Nothing. Nothing. This company's just, they just give me money for doing things. And that's it. Right. And I want more. Right. And, <laughs> you know, the, the oh, just the, the, ugh, the, the sickening yep. nature of, of trying to paint things as we're a family. Okay. So, like, if you had kids and they didn't do their chores or they didn't, you know, wake up on time, are they out on the street? You know, would would you yeah. toss them out if they stopped making you a profit? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> At least I would hope not. Yeah. yeah, they, yeah, don't believe those sorts of lies. That's <laughs> that's terrible. Ooh. All right. Um, if you didn't, if you had anything else, um, no, nope. yeah, no, we can go on. Okay, let's keep moving. on an icy night. You will find a barefooted child asleep, with its bundle of papers in its arm. Child labor costs so little that it may well be employed every evening to sell ten penny worth of papers, at which the poor boy will receive a penny, or a penny half penny. And lastly, you may see a robust man tramping, dangling his arms. He has been out of work for months. Meanwhile, his daughter grows pale in the overheated vapors of the workshop for dressing stuffs, and his son fills blacking pots by hand or waits hours at the corner of a street till a passerby enables him to earn a penny. And so it is everywhere, from San Francisco to Moscow, and from Napoli to Stockholm. The waste of human energy is the distinguishing and predominant trade of industry, not to mention trade, where it attains still more colossal proportions. What a sad satire is that name, political economy, given to the science of waste of energy under the system of wagedom. This is not all. Go ahead. So the last time we talked, I think we talked a little bit about automation. Mm-hmm. And but this part here 
it reminds me about externalities. Mm -hmm. And we could even go back to the where Kropotkin was talking about the string tying with like the broken hands and the carrying of those trays of matches with the yes. bald girls. And the results of those things were like physical degradation and sickness and death and, you know, mm -hmm. crippling, crippling injuries. Right. And those are externalities of that right. business, whatever was going on in those places, right. the lace thing or whatever and child labor and homelessness and despair there are also externalities in these examples, I think. Absolutely true. You, you know, they're the costs, the waste, and the pollution that are, you know, spewed from these companies and, and, and the people, the employees, and the other citizens are forced to pay for those externalities, and the, and the company never, never will. Absolutely. You know, there's that old saying, I don't know if it's an old saying, but there's that saying that something like the companies at the they privatize the profit and socialize the, the risk right. or the cost. Right. Um, well, they, they also like the, the part where they're talking about socializing the, like the risk and the cost is those are the externalities, right? Mm -hmm. All those broken men tying those strings together and all those young ladies made bald by their work. The company doesn't compensate them when they're broken, broken. The community does. If anyone does. Yeah. If anyone. Yeah. And the obvious, you know, sadness of, you know, he's talking about the barefoot paper seller. Mm -hmm. It just drives it home even more. It's really just despicable. All right. At least, you know, that's what I get when I hear that stuff. I, I think that's a, that's a tremendously good point. Yeah. He, it never shows up on the balance sheets. The when, when you're calculating waste and, and, mm -hmm. and efficiency, uh, human life never shows up on the waste yeah. category. And but yet it shows. Oh, sorry. I was just going to say it shows mm -hmm. up on like the balance sheet of the city or the town or the state. Right. Right. And then people use that to say, oh, look how much these crippled people cost. Look how much these homeless people cost. Right. And they use it to demonize the the citizenry mm -hmm. instead of the company that's actually, you know, pushing these people onto the street in a crippled state. Absolutely true. Yeah. And, and you see it in uh, companies like Walmart who pay their average workers so little that they have to go on, on food support. Yeah. And that's yeah, the, the yeah. very literal way that, that those, those costs of keeping people alive, like literally keeping people alive are, are pushed to this is the society, the community as a whole. Yeah. Yeah. We're subsidizing their, uh, sorry, I almost swore it again. We're, we're, don't, don't worry about that. <laughs> we're as long as it's not slurs, then, then you're good. Okay. We're subsidizing <laughs> their terrible wages. Absolutely. You know, absolutely. But yeah, yeah. And yet we're meant to believe that the, these g genius business people that can keep prices down so low. And, yeah. and, and if we ever question that, well, they might have to raise prices. You know, if we ever ask yeah. them to, to provide more for their own employees, well, then they're, they're just going to pass the buck right along to the consumer, mm -hmm. even though it never seems to end up actually happening that way when those sorts right. of things happen. Funny how that works. All right. Well, let's continue on here. We're, okay. we're getting pretty close to the, the stopping point. Um, and we're, yeah, making good time. So let's keep going. If you speak to the director of a well-organized factory, he will naively explain to you that it is difficult nowadays to find a skillful, vigorous, and energetic workman who works with a will. Quote, should such a man present himself among the 20 or 30 who call every Monday asking us for work, he is sure to be received even if we are reducing the number of our hands. We recognize him at the first glance, and he is always accepted, even though we have to get rid of an older and less active worker the next day." Unquote. And the one who has just received notice to quit, and all those who receive it tomorrow, go to reinforce that immense reserve army of capital, workmen out of work, who are only called to the loom or the bench when there is pressure of work or to oppose strikers. And those others, the average workers that are the refuse of the better class factories, they join the equally formidable army of age and indifferent workers that continually circulates between the second class factories. Those which barely cover their expenses and make their way in the world by trickery and snares laid for the buyer, and especially for the consumer in distant countries. You know, that, that brings up for me, um, 
a, a passage from uh, a Christmas carol, right? getting back to that Dickensian idea. Um, anyone who hasn't read the actual original version of, of A Christmas Carol, uh, if you've just seen some of the, the movies, then you should definitely do yourself a favor and go back and read it because there really is a class consciousness in especially the, the first part of the book there. And he, he's, he's speaking as, as Scrooge and, and he's talking about how um, the person's coming to collect for charity to, to help people out. And uh, I don't remember the exact exchange, but it ends up with, with Scrooge saying, uh, people better get, you know, better hurry up and die. You know, the, these, these <laughs> wretches of the earth better hurry up and die and decrease the surplus population. And that, and, and that for me is exactly what Kropotkin is talking about. These people just become from the, the eyes of the, the business people, surplus population who, who's, who's, best contribution they have left to give to humanity is just to die and get out of the way for the next round of workers to be put into their machines. Yeah. They're, they're meat for the meat grinders. Exactly. That's, that's, that's a, that's a really succinct way of putting it. I like that. Yeah. Boy. All right. Well, continue on. And if you talk to the workmen themselves, you will soon learn that the rule in such factories is never to do entirely what you're capable of. Shoddy pay, shoddy work. This is the advice which the working man receives from his comrades upon entering such a factory. And good advice today, too, still. Yeah. You know, yep. if, if you're unfortunate enough to have to take one or two or, or even three uh, minimum wage jobs at a time, yeah, put in the minimum work. That, that, that yeah. should be your duty as a worker. I, you know, yeah. Not saying ever endanger your, your, your position, but... You don't owe them anything. And, and if they're only willing to toss you crumbs, they should get crummy work, you know, yeah. to, to coin yeah. a phrase. Agreed. Cool. All right. For the workers know that if in a moment of generosity they give way to the entreaties of an employer and consent to intensify the work in order to carry out a pressing order, this nervous work will be exacted in the future as a rule in the scale of wages. Therefore, in all such factories, they prefer never to produce as much as they can. In certain industries, production is limited so as to keep up high prices, and sometimes the password "go canny" is given, which signifies bad work for bad pay. You pause. Wage work sure. is. Go ahead. So, just kind of building off what you were saying before, mm-hmm. I really, I really loved that "go canny" thing. Yeah, I hadn't, the, I, I hadn't <laughs> remembered that from the last time I read it. That's you know, cool. the shoddy work for shoddy pay mantra, right. mantra, and. It reminded me of another personal story I have where I got a yearly review from my one of my bosses. Mm-hmm. And this was at the last company I worked for before the one I'm at. So we got reviews every, I think it was every year. And I got a bad review. And, you know, the guy comes over to me and it wasn't really, um, they weren't really formal. Mm-hmm. So they just kind of grab you wherever you were and be like, hey, you know, this is your good worker, your mediocre worker, whatever. Sure. So the, it was actually the owner of the company. He pulls me to the side. He says, uh, like, we gave you a bad review this year. I'm like, oh, man. But honestly, I didn't really care because if they fired me, I was not worried. I didn't like being there. Mm-hmm. So I, I was like, okay. You know, we just kind of looked at each other for a few seconds. And uh, he said, well, don't you want to know why? Uh, well i said okay sure Uh, you know shoot your shot there boss man (laughs) so (laughs) so he says and i kid you not he says you got a bad review because you only do what's required of you oh i've gotten that same thing (laughs) yeah i got a bad review for doing my job yeah and i mean listen if you give me a list of stuff to do Mm -hmm. that's what i'm gonna do yeah I'm not going to do extra. That's your job description. You know, if you want more or better, uh-huh. pay me more or better. Right. You know, I'll give you good work for good pay, and that's it. You want right. more work, you pay me more. Yeah. And, and, and workers, I, workers should adhere to that, too. That, you know, if it's not in your job description, you're not, you're not a family. You're not just doing favors for people. You're there to, to work. So yeah. get I someone else to do to it. Eat. Yeah, I need money to eat, but uh-huh. I am not going to give away my labor. Absolutely. That, that's and a good so process. anyway, the, the the worker attitude he was talking about, it just reminded me of that. And uh, I, I just loved it. Yeah. 
Yeah, absolutely. You know what that reminds me of too is um, have you ever seen the movie Office Space? Yes. Yeah, that I'm sure you know what I'm going to say. That that scene uh, where Jennifer Aniston's character she works at like an Applebee's sort of a place, <laughs> and uh, they're required to wear flair on their suspenders, and it's these yep. these kitschy little buttons. Um, and she gets a bad performance review because she only has the minimum number of, of pieces of flair. And she's like, yeah, yeah, you know, I, I got all my flair. And she's like, what's, what's the problem? And he's like, well, uh, look at Ricky over there. He's, he's got, you know, 54 pieces of flair. Now that's going above and beyond. And, and that's what we like to try and, and foster at whatever the name of the place was. And she's like, oh, oh, some more flair. And he's like, well, if you only want to do the bare minimum, then, yeah. then sure. <laughs> But that's not what you want, is it? You don't want just to just do the bare minimum. And he, he went into like the, yeah, you know, we're yeah. a family, that sort of thing. Yeah, that. Ricky needs a union. <laughs> yeah. Is what, I'm, is what I'm getting from this story. Absolutely. I, they, yeah, they all need to be unionized. <laughs> Man. Oh, that's just so bad. Yeah, I, I had a similar experience myself when I, I did a summer uh, after high school um, as a cashier at, at Target. And, and I was like, you know, I would be friendly and and whatever with the the customers but i wasn't like chatting them up about what are you what are your plans later today or all the all the other stuff that some of the people do and luckily i had a a manager that that um uh respected that sort of thing like didn't really care about that but she's like well yeah yeah, i'm supposed to give you a bad review because you know you, you you're cordial to the customers but you're not like chatting them up and stuff and i'm like oh okay and then i just went back and did the same thing that i was doing before yeah Yeah. (laughs) Uh, all right. Did you have anything more on that, or, or should we? No, no, that's keep... cool. That's it. All right. Surf work. It cannot. It must not produce all that it could produce, and it is high time to disbelieve the legend which represents wage them as the best incentive to productive work. If industry nowadays brings in a hundred times more than it did in the days of her grandfather, it is due to the sudden awakening of physical and chemical sciences towards the end of last century not to the capitalist organization of wagedom, but in spite of that organization. Part three. That probably is a good place to leave it for tonight. We're just about the 18 minute mark. Yeah. um, That's about halfway through. The only thing I'd say about that last part is that he says not, he says, I've been reading along as we're going. So it, he said, yeah. n- not to the capitalist organization of wagedom, but in spite of that organization. Mm-hmm. And that's right. Mm-hmm. In spite of. That's absolutely I, true. Yeah, I just really love that whole section. And it brought up a smile to my face when I read it again. Nice. So, nice. yeah, I mean, I think uh, I think that's it for, you know, immediate immediate thoughts. Cool, cool. Did you did you have any thoughts about the, the the chapter so far in general that we didn't quite cover yet, or what do you think? Well, I don't think so. I think we sure. uh, did a pretty good job there. All right. Well, very cool. Well, yeah. Maybe we should uh, wrap it up for the night then. Okay. Um. Thank you so much for for being so generous with your time. Coming back next week for for part two of this chapter. I really no appreciate problem. that. Yeah. Yeah. Thank there's you. been a lot of thank fun so far too. Yeah. Absolutely. So happy to have you. So uh, what, what's coming up for uh, Tribunus Pleb- Pleb- Plebis? Oh, man. Sorry. Ple- uh, Plebis. 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 What, what's uh, coming up well, for you next? We've got current event stuff as usual. Very cool. Um, I've got a couple of history episodes that I'm working on Ooh. that hopefully should be out soon. Nice. And, yeah, that's it for the immediate future. We've got cool. some plan. I'm hoping to uh, get into streaming and maybe yeah, some actual videos. That. Yeah, but uh, you know, I'm, I I need a little bit more time, <laughs> but we're working on it. That's we're cool. It. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, if you ever need anyone to to come on and uh, any of your streams, I'm I'm definitely available. I'll just put myself right. out awesome. there. Awesome. Very cool. Yeah. So yeah. So if you would like to to uh, find more about the Tribunus Plebis uh, podcast and, and all the things that they do, the I would assume the best way to go is uh, to go to your website. Will that be right? Uh, yeah, website. Just search, you know, Tribunus Plebis on whatever yep. podcast player or YouTube. You Very know. cool. Yeah. Twitter Very is cool. Tribunus Media. Tribunus Media. Yeah. Okay. Very good. Very good. All right. Uh, well, I think that's going to do it for tonight. I'm going to thank you once again for 
coming on the show and, and lending your opinion. It's, it's been very illuminating and, 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 and a lot of fun too. So awesome. Thank you. Zach. Thanks. I appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you so much. You have a great evening. Yeah. You too, man. Thank you. Bye. Bye. All right. So that's going to do it for the stream tonight. Uh, oh, if you are uh, interested in, in continuing on with, with this sort of thing, I will be back here uh, Friday of next week. I do have a Friday night. Uh, I do the theory stuff uh, at 7 p.m. Central Standard Time. Uh, you can find all of my work over on my link tree. If you just go to link tree, uh, so that's L-I-N-K-T-R dot E-E slash bread underscore theory. You can find my Twitch, my YouTube, my podcast stuff, Facebook, all the all the various projects that I'm involved with. And recently, I've been I've been doing a, a side project with one of my Facebook groups, um, Left Pod Posting, which which tries to platform and, and boost the the reach of leftist plat, um, podcasters. Uh, I've been live streaming on Facebook with with that page, um, so that uh, the page that's connected with the group is called um, uh, Left Pod Radio. And uh, so if you go there and like that, you can get alerted to the uh, whenever we go live with that. And I've just been loading up a, a, a block of podcasts and just kind of letting it play throughout the day. Um, and recently we've been doing it on the theme of uh, the conflict in Palestine. So had a, a few rounds of, of podcasts that dealt with that. Uh, so if you're interested in that sort of thing, go over to Facebook and, and search for Left Pod Radio, and then also the group Left Pod Posting, uh, which is where you can interact with a lot of different leftist podcast creators and, and you know, talk about what's what you're listening to and, and all that sort of good stuff. So uh, you can find all those links at my link tree again. Um, other than that, before we go, I'd like to give a shout out to my grandma who recently passed away. So uh, shout out to Lois. Um, she was 93 years old, so she lived a good long life. Uh, we recently had our uh, funeral for her this last Wednesday. Um, but uh, yeah, it, 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 it was uh, very tough for her in the end days. Um, she had a lot of um, cognitive problems. And in fact, uh, the thing that, that, that finally was the, um, what kind of really sent her down the, the most was uh, she got COVID tragically. And that, that did a lot of damage to her lung system. She, she survived the initial uh, disease, but then she declined quite a lot since that point. And at, at 93 years old, that's, that's definitely understandable. But she had a good long life. She was a really sweet and, and kind person. So going to miss her a lot anyway. So uh, love you, Grandma, and I miss you. <laughs>